Research focuses on uh, non parametric, um, focuses on non parametric and the high dimensional inference with complex data. He does both theory and the computation. His work is supported by many grants from NSF, NIH, and some other agencies. And um, he is currently an associate editor of Beta Analysis, and he is on the scientific oversight committee, committee of extracorporeal life support organization. Um, according to what I what I have heard, Meng is probably the most popular professor they had right at university. Being as, I mean, being as a professor, professor, he has already supervised eight PhD students and one postdoc. So today he is going to teach us semi-parametric inference for local exchange. Yeah. All right. Thank, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Chen, for the uh, overly generous introduction. So. Uh, there are many popular professors at Rice. Okay, right. And, and thanks, uh, Yang, for inviting me, and thanks the department for having me here. It's it's absolutely a great pleasure to be here in person and for this visit. Right. So uh, today's talk is about uh, local extrema. So it's kind of some local stuff, and to to help it to better relate to ourselves. So local things are very challenging, like like today's weather. Right. Who would have thought? Right, the weather can be so freezing a week ago, right? And then if you check the weather looking like, you know, a week or so looking back, it's just like not, nothing happened before, right? So that means local features are challenging. And we are going to see this re recurrent challenge by dealing with local extrema, okay? Um, so uh, just a few acknowledgements. So this is based on a couple of joint work with my students and former postdoc and collaborators. So Zhejian Liu is currently a fourth year PhD student working with me and at RISE. Uh, so he's doing wonderful. And Chen Han Yu was a former postdoc advised by Marina and myself. And now he's assistant professor at Marquette. And Simon and Colin, those are two collaborators from psychology at RISE. And Marina is a colleague and a friend. So support is from NSF and NIH. Okay, so look at features. Why? local features, right? Why not global features? So actually finding localized feature of a smooth function, they are just very important in many scientific applications. So often the time, like let's say in biology, those local extrema of some profile data are exactly the biological biomarkers you want to look at. So they are interpretable, they are important. And uh, so in, in many fields, you want to do peak detection. So those peaks, are local features, like local maxima or local minima. So kind of local features. Yeah, and in this talk, we are, uh, we are going to focus on a motivating uh, example as well as data application. So that is related to event-related potential, which we are going to elaborate on a little bit more in the next page. Uh, that is uh, from psychology. So in psychology, people do experiments and put many electrodes on these subjects and the record signal, they are going to do analysis on event-related potential. So we are going to see more uh, next, okay? And so you can imagine the list can, can run very long. Localized features are just important. And so other than uh, scientific applications, in statistics, they are also important, right? So because for a known function, you can characterize the shape by using local features. Like where is a peak, where is a deep, right? Things like that. And it's, use, it's a useful thing to do for visualization and for interpretation. So that is for statistics. And also for operation research, when you do optimization, of course you want to kind of pay attention to those local extrema so that you can maximize this function globally, right? So they give you insight when you do optimization. And in this talk, among so many local features, we are going to focus on uh, local extrema when you have a noise and noise is just everywhere. That's why we deal with that. So let's look at this event related potential ERP analysis more closely. Uh, so ERP is based on some EEG signal. And when you re record EEG signal, you put a lot of electrodes on the surface of the head, right? Because it's kind of not invasive, it's not invasive. So that means you do not remove the skull, which would be invasive, right? So skull is there 
And if you remove the scale, the data set is called IEG, like inversive, right? So, but here we don't do that. So the scale is here and you put electrodes on, the, on that. You hope to record brain signals using those electrodes. Because the scale is there, it's like a very thick wall. So the signal to noise ratio is just very, very low because the existence of, of the scale, right? So as a result, ERP waveforms, they are extremely noisy for, for good reasons, yeah. And so here are, uh, here are, okay, so let's, so you see those are EEG uh, signals. They are very noisy. They are corresponding to the same event, the same task, and you see those signals. And uh, they are barely interpretable if you just look at a one waveform. So what people do in this field is to collect many. So for one subject, sit here, do your experiments for a period of time, like one hour or so. And I'm going to collect many, many trials for the same patient. And also I'm going to repeat my experiment across different subjects. At the end of the day, I'm going to average all that. So per subject and across subject, average all those data to have my kind of population level ERP. And you are going to start to see something like this. Smoother, looks nicer, right? And then you see those kind of peaks, like they have names because they correspond to different events or reaction to some task or stimuli. So, and the, typically the, the, depending on where it occurs, it has N and P and give a time, give a name for that. So those are, uh, uh, in psychology, those are interpretable. Those are very important, okay? And there's challenge, of course, because the data is so noisy, right? So how trustable your inference is. And, and in this field, as I mentioned, people just do excessive averaging. So average everything so that we can improve signal to noise ratio. We would ask, so can you do better? So if you collect so many different trials across different subjects, can you do some kind of subject specific or subject level inference or even trial in, uh, level inference so that you can make better use of your data, right? Save you some money and save everybody time. Just do better statistics. Uh, and uh, so then we have some kind of positive answers uh, to that question, but this is basically our main motivation. Our data is very noisy and we want to infer those local extrema. So the reason we lo look at local extrema is, so like for example, for this kind of population, this is a kind of cartoon, it's just too smooth. Uh, P3 and N1, those are two kind of ERP events. And given a kind of data set or noisy observation, you want to determine the latency of those kind of two peaks, like P, P3 and N1, uh, when it occur, yeah. And you want to determine that and give it a name. So that is very important in psychology. And statistically speaking, we know those are just local extrema, right? So they are kind of, those are the peaks here, and this is the peaks on the negative side, okay. yeah. All right, so it's not difficult to formulate this statistically. Let's say we have a regression function F, and we have some noise. We have to have this noise term because our data has a lot of noise. And we want to infer those stationary points, uh, TM. And if you give me like the number of, of stationary points or local extrema, uh, we can write a function in this way. So this is our constraint, okay? And often the time we don't know this capital M. We don't know how many there are, right? Uh, you probably have a rough idea, like how many you should expect to have, but exactly the number of M is unknown to us, right? So this is a regression model. You have the additional kind of constraint on TM, but that's just a shape constraint, right? It's, it's, uh, uh, the only difference here is instead of doing inference on F, we are more interested in TM, those stationary points or local extrema. So this is our kind of uh, the, the, the object we want to draw inference on. And so this is also part of the challenge because uh, they are not the global function F, they are local features TM, right? Local features can be very irregular, irregular like local weather, okay? And, uh, and for F, it, if you have it, that's good, but it's not the kind of most important thing in this, in this work or in this problem. So to relate that to ERP application, uh, those Ys would be ERP time series observation. So you have noise observation. And those F would be the underlying smooth ERP component. So very smooth. And uh, it's like the population level ERP. Yeah. And you have M ERP components at T1 up to TM. 
such that the first order derivative is equal to zero, we want to find those TM, potentially draw inference about those TM. That is our goal. Estimate them and quantify uncertainty in your estimation. For F part, it's, we, we just have too many methods for that. It's a nephromatric regression problem. Uh, if you are Bayesian, you can do the Bayesian way, like Gaussian process, random series prior, all you can imagine, right? If you are frequentist, you can do basis expansion and many basis choices for us, right? So it's kind of a very mature literature. We know how to do that. So here, let's just grab GP. But actually, in general, you can use random series and some other, prior, some other approaches we just mentioned. So uh, give it a GP prior Gaussian process. Uh, just to review, for GP prior, you just need to provide the mean function and covariance kernel. That is our mu and, and kernel, okay? And, and then uh, we have uh, a couple of choices for kernel and we know how to do that. Theoretically, they are very sound and practically we have good uh, computationally scalable approach to do the computation, okay? So this is all good. Uh, for unknown function f, nephromatric regression. But now our challenge is about t. So where is t? Okay. So the question is how to encode the derivative information into this GP or any chosen nephromatric approach and how to use it to infer t. Okay. Yeah. And so the good thing about GP is the derivative of GP is also a GP, right? So we, we probably know this because derivative is a linear operator. You kind of take linear operator of GP, you get another GP, okay? And we can define a derivative constrained Gaussian process by doing conditioning. So condition, like you give me a GP, I tell you that at T point, the derivative is equal to zero. Doing the conditional, doing the conditioning, then you are going to get another GP. So we can define, using that conditioning, thick, we can define a derivative constrained GP, DGP. And uh, so the, for any given kernel you start with, the mean function would be like this and the covariance kernel would be like this. So this kind of is a new Gaussian process because it's related to derivative constraint. So we call it DGP, derivative constraint GP. So any T vector, any, it doesn't need to be the ground truth, just any vector we can define this way. Okay. And the property is it will give you a Gaussian process such, such that if you draw sample paths from that Gaussian process, evaluate the first derivative of all those sample paths at t, the derivative is equal to zero. This is how you derive this, so it's not, it's not a surprise, right? And, but still, let, let's look at this sample path visualization just to convince you DGP does what it's supposed to do. All right, so the left-hand side, this is just a Gaussian process with squared exponential kernel, no constraint. And from that Gaussian process, we do the conditioning and derive the DGP. And at, point, at a given point, x equal to negative four and positive four, right? And you would say those, all those sample paths will satisfy that first order derivative at those points are equal to zero. So they are kind of regularized in terms of a derivative, right? By design, it has to be this way. Okay? Right, and, and then you can play the kind of Bayesian uh, machinery and uh, you have a derivative constraint Gaussian process and you hope to infer T, but you don't know it. What you do, give it a prior, right? Give it a prior, uh, use Bayes theorem, get your posterior distribution, right? So let's kind of do this one time and then let's talk about the pitfalls of this approach. So Recall that T1 up to TM are those parameters we hope to estimate. You will have M of them. Just for a moment, we assume we know those, uh, this M number. So M is given to us. Actually, let's assume even more information. Uh, we assume for each local extremum, we know roughly the location. So basically given a zero to one interval, we know the partition of, the, of zero to one, such that each interval enclosed one and only one local extremum point. So you know where they are. You don't, you, you know how many there are and you know where they are, right? So that's a lot of prior knowledge, right? But let's assume so. So this, this assumption uh, is very restrictive and not really practical, but it's a strong benchmark because you use so many, so many kind of useful pieces of information in the prior specification, okay? And nephromatic quantity F is a nuisance parameter. We are not interested in it, so we can marginalize out. 
And other than F and T, you have some other tuning parameter in this approach. For example, if you choose a kernel, you probably have some kernel-based parameter. Let's use theta to denote all that. So if you use squared exponential, you probably have two parameter, hyperparameter, like a tau and an H. H is a bandwidth parameter, but you just have two of them, so not too many, yeah. And in addition to all that, like T, F, theta, you also have sigma squared, the variance of your noise, okay? So this is kind of a sort of an oracle setting. We have the prior setup. You can draw posterior inference, okay? So let's do that. We develop a uh, Monte Carlo uh, EM algorithm to do parameter tuning and posterior inference. Uh, it's, it's kind of a little bit stand, uh, standard, but the, the reason we kind of pick this algorithm is you can use EM algorithm to do parameter tuning and also you do a uh, posterior update, right? So the algorithm looks like this. In the E step, you draw samples of any unknown quantity, like T sigma squared, just draw samples. And uh, in the M step, you maximize the marginal likelihood of your unknown parameter theta, that is your hyperparameter, maximize it using MAP by maximizing the posterior distribution in some way to tune your theta. So this is a kind of routine procedure to select the hyperparameters. Yeah. Okay, and then you just iterate until you reach convergence. At the end of the day, you have your hyperparameter tune, uh, tuned and you also have your posterior sample. Okay? So you can do your posterior inference. And this uh, posterior inference procedure is good for the oracle situation where you know the ground truth for M and roughly the location. It's also uh, applicable for, for some extreme case like M equal to one. So generally applicable. Yep. But let's, let's face this reality, right? We just don't know M in practice. And you also probably don't know the location, right? If you know those things, you, you can just handpick those locations. But in practice, we don't know. And so this is a real challenge. And a standard strategy, if you do basic, would be let's do hierarchical modeling. So I don't know M, give it a prior. I don't know location, give it a prior, right? So whatever we don't know, give it a prior. Oh, wow, it, 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 it would work, but it's just kind of not, not that good in terms of uh, computation. So the real challenge is actually, I list a couple of representative challenges here because the dimension of T is unknown. Right? So that means you have a varying dimensional parameter. If you change M, if you give M a prior, let's Poisson distribution, let's say, right? For different M, you have a different dimension for your T. And then how do you kind of draw sample to make sure you have a good mixing? That, that's kind of a nightmare, right? You probably can consider reverse jump MCMC, but the mixing issue and how do you kind of improve sampling efficiency, those are kind of daunting challenges, right? And although you could do that, we just don't think that would be promising, right? It's, it's just very difficult. And we instead consider a new proposal. So this is a key novelty of our proposal. And we just assume a univariate prior on T. We know that you, you have M of them, M is unknown. M could be one, could be two, could be three. That is your ground truth, right? But in the prior specification, we just assume you have at least a one. We just deal with one dimensional T and give it a one dimensional prior. So basically you just assume, as I said, we assume at least you have one stationary point in the true function, at least a one, right? We don't control how many, like the strategy above using reverse jump MCMC would have a tight control, but instead we don't do the tight control thing, right? So conceptually it's just like, you know, like there are some parents who want to control everything, like your kids need to do this, do that. And there are some parents who are a little bit hands-off, give you some flexibility, right? And then uh, it might work. So this is our proposal. And a univariate prior of T uh, has some kind of merits. So first of all, it gives you efficient computation because you just assume T is one-dimensional question. So, um... If you fit it with the Galkian process without any constraint. Yeah, without any constraint. Yeah. Yeah. And then you can get it stationary points. Yeah. What would go wrong if you just did that? Sure, great question. So so the, the procedure works as follows. You fit a GP, no constraint at all. You get your posterior distribution. 
and then you want to get the station, stationary point of all your posterior samples, right? So there are a couple of issues. So first, this is kind of an um, uh, inverse problem, right? So the posterior sample of, from that Gaussian process might have many, many stationary points. And if you draw different samples, the number of stationary points may differ from sample to sample. It's very difficult to align them. Yeah. And actually, we compare this proposed approach with uh, something similar to what you just said. So basically, you fit a nephrometric regression and then do a second step, stationary point extraction. So typically, it's not stable. Yeah. Particularly when you have noise. Yeah. We are going to, it's a valid approach. We are going to compare with it. Yeah. Sure. Uh, well, it's time series data, but we just view that as a regression problem. Yeah, so, so for now, yes, for this general framework, we do not have, have correlated epsilon i, but yeah, that we, we can extend to that. Yeah. Okay, so let's, let's, for now, let's have some hype for this proposal, right? Yeah, so why is it so good, right? Uh, so first of all, it's efficient because it's univariate, right? Univariate, right? How hard could it be? Just one dimensional thing. And simple, right? conceptually simple, computationally simple, right? And uh, also because we just assume at least one, so you do not misspecify M, right? If you specify a M, even a kind of a lower bound and upper bound, you probably have some chance to misspecify it. But now just at least one, you cannot go wrong with this, right? Yeah, it's just like too liberal maybe, but if you well control it later, then probably it's, it's doing the right thing, right? So we, we, we see a lot of merits in this approach, but it's a little bit unconventional. And before we proceed to the theory part, let's see a proof of concept. Yeah, just use this toy example. So this is a 2F, this is a 2F. There are two stationary points, T1 and T2, are those two values. And sample size and how we generate X, they are given here. And we replicate this experiment using 100 uh, independent data sets. Okay? And we uh, compare two approaches, just for now. First one is called a single DGP, which is a, propo which is a proposed method. The one-dimensional, univariate, easy, okay? and easy to compute and easy to understand. But let's see how it works. And a multiple DGP, that is uh, the Oracle DGP. You know the true M and you know the location. So you know a lot of things. It's not realistic, but let's just compare these two, okay? And for both methods, we run the MCEM algorithm for parameter tuning and for sampling, okay? Let's see what happens. So the top panel give you the fitted curve. And so the fitted curve, as, as we mentioned before, is not very important. Let's just directly go to the posterior distribution of T. You have two T, okay? So the left panel give you the distribution of T uh, in a multiple DGP framework because you, you have disjoint intervals. So, and expectedly, you should have like a two distributions, one for left and one for right. You are using the right information. So there, within each interval is bell shape. So it looks good, yeah? And let's look at the, single DGP thing, right? This, you just assume a univariate T, although you know the true M is equal to two. Let's see the posterior distribution of T. It is bimodal, right? But also interpretable, right? Because if you compare the two shapes, although they are not the same distribution, but the right one is, is kind of interpretable in that it has two modes. If you do a right posterior summary, then you can estimate M with two very easily, right? So it shows some promise. Is that a potentially a question? Sure. So your method is basically finding the most pronounced extrema in a particular sample? Yes. We want to find an on effect. Right, but you're only picking one. Oh, uh, we are going to pick an on effect. Well, ultimately, after you've done, after you've done sampling, but yeah. each sample is giving you one. Uh, each, uh, yes, each sample will give you one, then you collect all of them, you will have a distribution. That's correct. Yeah. Yes. So we look at the shape, they look similar, and this one looks promising, but now you need to have a good posterior summary to tease out that useful information. 
uh, using this uh, anchor traditional approach, right? A reasonable thing to do is just HPD, highest posterior density region, right? So look at this one. If you draw a ruler here, like here, to make sure the posterior distribution covers is, co is covered by 95% probability, right? You would get those two modes for sure. And they are quite accurate, right? So those, this is a kind of proof of concept shows us if you use the uh, univariate T as a prior and you couple that with some intelligent posterior summary, you could get a good estimate of M and you can also get an interval estimates for each T, right? As, as a proof of concept. And let's recap. Sure. It's hard to get a third of joint of T. Yeah. It's hard. Uh, it's, I agree it's hard. We are going to get it. Yeah. Right. No matter how hard it is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In a frequency sense. Yeah. Uh, so let's, let's kind of sub, have a recap of this approach. We call this approach encompassing approach. Encompassing means you just at least have one T. That is your assumption, although you want to infer all of them, okay? And we use single DGP, we advocate this approach. We index possibly multiple local extrema just using one single parameter, univariate, okay? And this encompassing approach is appealing because you don't need to specify how many M you want to go with, right? And it's also computationally fast, univariate. There's no varying dimensional thing. No reverse jump MCMC. Okay. And proof of concept shows is, is promising, and, but this is an unconventional basic approach, right? So you want to justify why this approach works, not only using simulation, but probably see like a more uh, characterization of the posterior distribution. So this is why we resort to uh, asymptotics to justify this is a good approach, right? And, and well, this is a semi-parametric Bayesian approach. So uh, we, of course, immediately we hope to use some existing literature just to get the theory done, right? But it, unfortunately, it doesn't work that well. So let's look at the literature review first. Uh, we are interested in the inference on TM, where uh, F is unknown. This is a semi-parametric problem. And in the past two decades, uh, we have a lot of good theory. So we now have a general theoretical framework for semi parametric base and net parametric base. We can do posterior contraction. We can do distributional approximation like bernstein wall mises BVM theorem. We can do all that, right? And there is general theory for BVM for uh, semi parametric and net parametric problems, right? Can we use them directly for this encompassing approach, right? It's difficult. So the challenges are, T and F, the prior on T and prior on F, they are not quite separable. So in this kind of existing semi parametric theory, typically the priors on these two things, T, finite dimensional, and F, they are separable, right? But in this case, they are kind of embedded in, in each other. It's not quite separable. We cannot kind of verify those conditions required for general theory, okay? And second challenge, we are doing derivative and function derivatives are challenging. So why they are challenging? So let's, let's look at this problem from two aspects. First, if, if you give me a, if you view derivative as a functional, maps a function to the derivative at any fixed point, view that as a functional, it's linear, right? According to chain rule, it's linear, right? But it's not bounded. There's no bounded functional can mimic first order derivative as a functional. Yeah. And this is a result from functional analysis. So it's not bounded, yeah. And, and for existing theory, you basically just assume the functional is smooth. Of course, it has to be bounded, right? So we cannot use that. And also another challenge is you, you want to infer the entire functional derivative. So it's a non parametric derivative. You want the whole derivative function. You probably want to use the information from that function and that is just more challenging. Yeah. And we actually discussed this challenge in a separate paper, like to, just to acknowledge derivatives are challenging and some possible strategies we can use to estimate that. So in that archive paper, okay? And another challenge is the dimension of local extrema is simply unknown, right? Okay, yeah, so those are challenges. We cannot use the existing approach. We need to develop something new, right? And our first result is about a uh, closer form expression of the posterior distribution. So this is not complicated, but very handy, okay? 
the posterior distribution of t univariate uh, proportional to this kind of given quantity. If you look at this, there are several pieces here, mu hat f and sigma hat f derivative, those two quantities. Those are the posterior mean and posterior variance without any derivative constraint. And in the current literature, we have the formula, we have a lot of good properties about those two quantities. And for the other thing, you have K11, that is just a first order derivative of your kernel. So this is a closed form expression. And, and we are going to build on this the formulation and develop some theory. And also it's very convenient for posterior sampling because I give you the formulation, right? Let's just draw samples from this univariate distribution where you do have closed form four. So it's no MCMC needed, yeah. Okay, and we make a few assumptions, but those are not restric restrictive assumptions. Uh, the true function need to be differentiable, right? The first order derivative is smooth and uh, sufficiently smooth. And the second assumption is this function has exactly M local extrema. M is unknown, so exactly M. Uh, we have a mild condition that uh, they cannot be at the boundary. So if you look at the interval from zero to one, we need to require the local extrema occur inside, not at the boundary, which is typically the case. If you reach a boundary, then it's slightly a different uh, scenario, okay? And third condition is for those M local extrema, the second order derivative is not equal to zero, right? So that means is we just look at a local extrema that can be identified based on second order test, okay? And this is not restrictive, yeah. And in some existing work on similar problems, they basically assume all stationary points are local extrema, which means they do not assume the existence of saddle point, yeah. And in our proposed approach, saddle point is okay. We just regularize local extrema. If you have some other saddle points, that's fine. Just leave, it, leave them there. And so later the posterior distribution will automatically adjust for them, right? So that's a kind of appealing uh, uh, property we found, yeah. Right, but those are the three assumptions for the true function, yeah. And choosing the kernel, uh, that's always a problem, but it turns out we don't need to be too restrictive. So kernel just need to be, uh, kind of belong to the C8 uh, function, which means it's sufficiently smooth. And the kernel is, cho is chosen by you. So you just choose whatever works. So this is not restricted, it's, it's estimation strategy. And we also define a, some, some notation just for, uh, pre, for, for uh, presenting the result. So F lambda is the approximate function uh, from this RKHS space of, of the kernel, right? So this is widely used in the learning literature and also GP regression in the Bayesian setting. So this is F lambda. And we assume uh, the kernel is kind of good in some sense, uh, which means the approximation property of F lambda is pretty good, right? So, and uh, without loss of a general reality, we just assume they are bounded by lambda to some power. In practice, you can always verify those assumptions because kernels are chosen by you. And actually in the paper, we provide uh, concrete examples how you verify those, basically just using direct computation, okay, right. Okay, some useful technical results. Uh, let's focus on the interpretation of those results. Uh, this lemma tells us uh, for the ground truth, for the TM, there's, there always exists a kind of T lambda M, which are local extrema points of F lambda that are very close to the ground truth. So you can find a neighborhood of TM such that they can be estimated by local extrema of F lambda. So they are as close as the function approximation, right? So this is a, a useful lemma. And so the second block is about non-asymptotic bounds. Uh, because we want to approximate the posterior distribution. So we need to bound all those derivatives very carefully. Those are non-parametric bounds, non, uh, I'm sorry, non-asymptotic bounds, which means for any sample size, you can bound them, like with probability like appro uh, approaching one, okay? We bound all that. And uh, we also develop a rescaled local asymptotic normality result for this problem. It is, it's, it's unlike, traditional local asymptotic normality property uh, because we have this rescaling factor. So for each TM, you actually have to rescale it so that you have the asymptotically normal uh, expansion in the local sense, okay? So those are intermediate uh, technical results. And this is the uh, 
uh, the, the kind of the most important technical results for this distribution. Uh, the first one, okay. The limiting distribution of posterior distribution with T has multimodal shape. The number of modes is exactly equal to M, right? We do not use any information in the entire estimation procedure, but the posterior distribution, asymptotically speaking, will give you this multimodal distribution. Yeah. Right, let's look at this convergence a little bit. So this is your true posterior distribution using in, 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 in encompassing base proposed approach. The pocket distribution is a mixture of normal. This big phi, that is a normal CDF distribution. Pi M, there are some weights. Okay? They are very close to each other, right? And for this mixture normal distribution, we know how to plot it. We know a lot of the things. We can get a quantile, we can get HPD. We, we know this one very well, right? Because this is a given distribution. So, and this theorem tells us the is a limiting distribution of your posterior distribution just is a mixture of normal, where the center is at the ground truth and the variance is given by this formula. Okay? So this gives you the rate. Yeah. yeah. And it gives you the weight too. So this is part one of our uh, main theorem. Part two is if you do proper rescaling and uh, truncation, you can convert your posterior distribution, which would be multimodal, uh, to a unimodal distribution within some intervals, right? The directly implied by part one. Okay. Let, let's look at those interesting comments. Yeah. And okay. sure. Yeah. Uh, very nice. Uh, regarding the weights, the points, yeah. uh, is it the case that by, do you have any information on the ordering of these weights? Like, is it highest at big M or? Because you, you do have actually M modes. We do have M right? You mean the relative height of those M modes in the posterior uh, density? Yes, you're getting this uh, mixture because yeah. your prior is saying you have at least one, so yeah. it's putting the mass over one, two, three, and all the way up to M. Uh, regarding so, so that's why it's that. Sure. Yeah, maybe let, let's look at a numerical example to see the true density function. And it's actually, it will display all M at the same time. Yeah, according to some mechanism, right? Yeah, so we will come back to that question yeah, once we are there, okay? So comments, um, we like this encompassing approach, right? Not only because it's simple, straightforward, efficient, but also because asymptotically it gives you the right thing, M modes, and centering at the right TM value, okay? And let's see the effect of curvature. And if the curvature is F second order derivative, right? It shows up in the variance. If the true curvature is very large. That means the Gaussian component is very concentrated. Yeah. And so it's very tight. Okay. We like that because that means less uncertainty. Okay. And, and if F, the curvature is essentially zero, then it disappeared in the posterior distribution. So it, that's why it automatically adjusts for a saddle point. Saddle point does not contribute to the posterior distribution asymptotically. That's why we don't need to assume anything about saddle point. Yeah. And the mixture weight is also proportional to this quantity, and that gives you some nice cancellation so that the posterior density will not kind of ignore a true TM if the curvature is very small. Actually, roughly that's the same. Okay. So let's look at a simulation to, to really elaborate on these comments. Okay. And the prior weight is very important. If your prior weight is uniform, it has zero effect in where the posterior mode should be. But if you have a very informative prior weight, then it will reflect in the posterior distribution. Yeah, right. And so before the simulation result, let's see another two implications, uh, point estimates and uncertainty quantification. Point estimates, if you grab your posterior distribution pi nt, that is a posterior distribution with a closed form expression. Okay? And asymptotically, this posterior distribution has exactly M local extrema. So this is a random quantity and asymptotically, it has exactly M local extrema. And those M local extrema denoted by TMN is very close to TM. So that is, that gives you consistency, right? And uh, it's practically relevant. The practical implication is if you use 95% HPD region, highest the posterior density region, then you are going to estimate all that. Yeah, for sure. 
right? You can change this value 95% to, let's say 80% to 99%, as emptotically they all behave the same, right? So you can use this posterior summary approach to get the estimates of M and also your estimates of T. So you, you have both of them by using HPD as your posterior summary technique. This is about point estimates. Interval, right? So we, we did a little bit of calculation so that we can compose this interval such that the coverage is equal to one minus alpha. When alpha equal to 0 0.05, that would be a 95% confidence interval for your TM, right? For each of them, okay? And uh, there are some unknown quantity in this interval, right? Let's say you have sigma and you have this true F0, we just do plug in. So whatever you don't know, plug in a consistent estimator, give you the right uh, interval estimates. Yeah. And this is interval estimates. So now let's come back to the joint interval thing. If using this theorem, you get a confidence interval or just broadly speaking, an interval estimates, be it credible interval, or confidence interval, just interval estimates. And the coverage is one minus alpha for each of those TM points, right? And uh, in order to have a joint interval, there are many things we can do, but for simplicity, we just use Bonferroni. So you have a joint confidence interval for all T's. Okay. And so uh, uh, brief comments, how we tune those unknown parameters like sigma kernel based parameter we just use maximum marginal likelihood without any constraint. So typically you have, you have closed form expression for the maximum likelihood for the likelihood function and you just maximize it, right? And we like this approach because it's computationally efficient and also we have strong uh, support for each of them. If you estimate sigma this way, it's consistent, actually stronger than consistent, it's mean square consistent. And for uh, parameter tuning for the kernel, like a bandwidth parameter H and tau, we can show that uh, they are kind of adaptive to the derivative order, which means the optimal choice of those two tuning parameters would be the same, no matter you are estimating the function itself or the derivative of this function. Yeah, the same tuning parameter. So this adaptivity is, uh, is not commonly shared. For smoothing spline and the local polynomial, you don't have this, but for kernel-based approach, you have that. So we like this approach uh, for tuning. And as we mentioned, no MCMC needed. Very fast, close the form expression, univariate, just do it, all right? And uh, so remark to verify uh, conditions required by those two theorems, uh, you just do some direct calculation. So in the paper, we provided two examples, uh, like a holder space and analytical function space, okay? Now let's see uh, simulations. Okay? So this is the true function we are using. And there are two, uh, there are three T's, T1, T2, T3. This is a simulated data set with size 100, okay, right? And uh, let's compare with this method. So those are, we tried a lot. We tried to search the literature and, and find a few. Those are the best we can, uh, we, we can do. We found those approaches, uh, uh, the kind of smooth the taut string approach, STS, and some modification with that. So basically the first two approaches Hot string, the original one and the smoothed one, they are closely related. So the second one is a uh, Annals paper. The first one is a CSDA paper. Okay, and third approach uh, is non-parametric kernel smoothing method by Song uh, and co-authors. That's a biometrics paper in two thousand six. So the, uh, it works as follows: you ask me the function using uh, kernel smoothing, and then you find a local extrema based on your estimated population mean. Very similar to the GP without any constraint, right? So let's see the performance of this approach. And here they are using kernel smoothing, but conceptually you can use GP regression, right? And yeah, without any constraint and do a second step extraction of local extrema. Okay? And so let's first look at our approach. This is a posterior density. I think this one is useful to really demonstrate what's going on here with this encompassing base approach. Uh, we are using one simulation, two different priors, uniform and beta 2, 3 at the prior for T. Okay? And we have three sample size. I can read it here. Uh, the smallest one is 100, go up to 500 and then uh, 1000. Okay? So three colors. And let's say the largest one, which is a black curve. So you see the three modes and, and the depth line are the ground truth. Okay? So they center at those ground truths, right? Give you that behavior as expected. 
if you change the prior, then the relative height will be changed. So prior has an immediate effect, right? But if you do a HPD, no matter you are using the prior on the left or the prior on the right, you are going to get these three modes for sure. And your estimates of M will be three. Okay. And so the relative height of those three, three modes are kind of equal uh, if you use a uniform prior. Uh, so this is a, this, uh, a summary for estimated M. So the, the basic take home message is M, M is large, then with high probability, we can estimate M hat equal to three yeah, for our approach. And for the other approach, let's pick NKS, which is the two-step approach, first estimates, and then uh, uh, tease out the TM hat information. So eight is just tend to give you large M, no matter what sample size you have. Sure. Yeah, Wow, well, yeah, that's uh, or we did not try that, but we tried something similar. We have one local extreme point for the function and one saddle point. That for then we apply our approach, the posterior distribution is unimodal, bell shape. Uh, that would be my expectation, yeah. All right, so let's see some numbers uh, for the sake of time. Uh, so our approach is just the best, RMSE, yeah, smallest one, yeah. And coverage of confidence intervals uh, using the interval estimates we proposed just give you the thing you expect to see, right. Uh, a caveat, sample size is equal to 100, we cannot achieve that. But for 500 and 1,000, the coverage is roughly the nominal level. And 100, we lost some coverage. And the last column, back to the question earlier, is a joint coverage using von Freund. It also tells us telling the same story. So large sample size, you get the right coverage. Okay. So ERP application, uh, we, we talked about this a lot in the past. But let's just uh, focus on the... Uh, so this is a real experiment in uh, fisher Baum's lab in psychology at Rice, and they want to see the ERP component related to the experiment they are interested in. Yeah, so let's, let's see the, how noisy it could be. Right? You see the true observation, just noisy, right? If you average everything, you are going to have the black curve. That is good. That is kind of, that's a strong signal, but we just want to do better than excessive averaging, right? And so this is a result for a single subject. And the, uh, we show this result to our collaborator. They are very excited because we don't need to use excessive averaging and we produce something interpretable to them as if they are using excessive averaging. That means you can, use, you can make an efficient use of your data without kind of wasting your data information, right? Actually, we have a follow-up uh, experiment. We have 72 trials of the ERP analysis. And we just use two of them. We get our posterior estimates of T very accurately compared to the estimates using 72 trials. So this is a more efficient use of data. Okay? And for multi-subjects result, we do the same thing, but on different subjects. So here are comparing like the older and the younger uh, generation and see where the ERP components are. And we observe substantial uh, subject level variability which makes sense. That means if you go ahead ignoring this variability, uh, you ignore the variability. So here we are able to recover that. And also younger people tend to have earlier ERP components, uh, which means they react faster relatively. Okay, yeah. Summary. Uh, we have proposed a Bayesian approach for local extrema of unknown function. And we like this encompassing approach. You don't need to specify the number of M. You don't need to specify the locations for that, right? And in order to understand why, how it behaves, we have some theoretical results, including uh, a multimodal limiting distribution, consistency, and interval estimation. So for ERP, uh, for ERP community, we believe this is a very good approach for them to consider. Now they can reduce statistics uh, based on the, exactly the same data as before, but have more information, okay? And we have some follow-up on that for a collaboration, okay? So some references. So this talk is mainly based on paper one and paper three. And uh, for some theoretical techniques, we also use results from two and four. 
And for ERP community, we have this follow-up file to make sure they know that data quality could be improved without collecting more data, but just using better statistics. Okay, right. And that's it, and I'm happy to take any questions. You mean at the boundary? Yeah, at the boundary, who gets more? I see. Yeah, at the, so that's a great question. So we, we find that in ERP analysis. At the boundary, you tend to have some local extrema, right? But you can, uh, li, uh, you, you can kind of... Uh, I pass that issue by using a more slightly more informative prior. So let's say instead of a uniform prior, you use a prior that put more weight in the middle, right? So it doesn't mean the true extrema do not exist at the boundary. It just means if they exist at the boundary, you are not interested in that, right? So you can use a prior to, 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 for that purpose. Sure. Maybe I missed that point, but is there any way to, uh, I guess, Get yeah, a of M? Do you have a point estimate of M? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Yeah. Is that possible? Uh, I think that's possible. We haven't done that. We haven't done that. So the reason there are a couple of reasons. If you do, let's say now for any M hat, we estimate M hat, and then we have uncertainty quantification for T. So that is something that, that is kind of advancement to us. And, and then if you want to talk about uncertainty on M the downstream inference for uncertainty of T will be problematic. So you need to deal with post-election inference more carefully, which we believe interesting, but a little bit challenging for now. Yeah, so that's a, that's a great future direction to consider for sure, yeah. Yeah. I was wondering, is it possible that say two local extrema are kind of dependent Say the identification of one extreme that highly depends on the successful identification of the other. Yeah. Uh -huh. In which case, your univariate trial approach may have some. Sure. Yeah. So if you have a dependency on those extrema thing, then. Uh, uh, you want to adapt this approach. Actually, we have some ongoing work for that. If you have different subjects, you believe they belong to the same population, but with some variation. So those T's will be related, but not exactly the same. So you can kind of play with those multiple DGP things to relate those T's, right? So that means if you do have prior knowledge to assume a specific correlation structure, you can use it in multiple DGP settings. Sure. Some small extreme, yeah. A very, a very small bump, yeah, okay. I see, yeah. If you, you have that kind of prior information about which small bump you want to overlook, you can use it. Because after you get a posterior distribution with T, you can estimate your function very easily. You can see how small they are. At this point, we are not doing thresholding, right? Uh, so because um, we want to get all of them, and HPD will automatically thresh out some very small bumps. Yeah. So I would say in order to achieve the purpose you just said, you want to couple the posterior distribution with T and the inference about F function. Couple these two things and to, to, uh, to obtain a good threshold. Uh, let's thank our speaker. Thank you. Yeah.